So I'm going to start with a quote from Augustine. Thought is not otherness, but sameness. Never aliud, but always ipsum. And I'm going to read it in Latin because it's so beautiful. We known as alias aliud et alias aliter said it ipsum et idipsum et idipsum. Who art not one thing in one place and another thing in another place, but the self same and the self same and the self same. That's the beautiful 16th century English translation of Edward, of William Watt. So writes Augustine in the Confessions, in a haunting phrase whose hammering repetition said, id ipsum et id ipsum et id ipsum, performs what it signifies, sameness. Against this backdrop, this backdrop of belief as a rejection of the other, as the ultimate identity, I want to consider Dante's sympathy for the other. In metaphysical terms, this sympathy correlates to the Christian doctrine of creation and to the affirmation of difference that we hear in Aquinas' statement, distinctio et multitudo rerum est a deo. I do that in Latin too because I love it so much. The difference and multitude of things comes from God. I now propose a correlation between the embrace of difference in the metaphysical domain that I have documented in the Paradiso, I hope. I'm thinking of the last three chapters of the Undivine Comedy. I'm, I'm proposing a correlation between that metaphysical <coughs> embrace of difference and Dante's many startlingly non-normative positions in the, norm in the social and historical sphere. In other words, my counterintuitive proposal is that Dante may embrace difference more in the social and historical dimension than we give him credit for, which is why I like the pictures, because it is a little counterintuitive, so I feel like the pictures give me a good backup. The Commedia is a text of enormous cultural authority that at the same time has been very little imitated. Its non-imitability is connected to both what is old and what is new about it, both to the trope of the other world vision, which was already dated when Dante decided to make use of it, and to a historicity that is so local and specific as to be unfungible. I suggest that Dante's radical historicity may function as a kind of prophylactic against stereotyping, and that in any case, whatever the cause of his radical historicity, he possesses a non-stereotyping imagination. As a corollary, let me add that the hugely imitated poet in the generation that followed his, Petrarch, was by contrast a brilliant stereotyper who created brilliantly fungible language that was enormously imitated, whereas actually Dante's was not. Dantean non-normativity requires historical context to gauge, which is another reason for its having going, gone largely unnoticed. The Commedia has spent most of its textual afterlife isolated from history. Consider that the article in Fair <coughs> in the Encyclopedia Dantesca, I'm sorry, I, I, if you can't hear, I'm doing my best. Uh, consider that the article in Fair in the Encyclopedia Dantesca jumps straight into the structure of Dante's hell without acknowledging that hell is an idea and that as such it has a history. Immersing the Commedia in historical context allows us with surprising frequency to see the absence of a normative response. Let us begin with sexuality. The souls of the circle of lust are explicitly defined carnal sinners, and yet Dante's treatment of carnal sinners is incommensurate with what we find either in vision literature or in contemporary moral poetry. The visions tend to treat the sins of incontinence, excess desire, with particular asperity and cruelty. Dante treats these sins with comparative mildness. The visions display what an editor of a recent translation of the visions in a handy little paperback called Visions of the Afterlife uh, to Dante, from the beginning to Dante, by Eileen um, Gardner. The visions display, quote, an obsession with sexual sin, such as adultery, fornication, promiscuity, and sodomy, unquote, there is no such obsession in the Divine Comedy. 
The visions demonstrate to what degree Dante, by contrast, could be said to desexualize lust. In the earliest Christian vision, St. Peter's Apocalypse, second century of the Christian era, we find women hung by their hair, hair that they plaited, quote, now I'm quoting from St. Peter's Apocalypse, that they plaited, quote, not for the sake of beauty, but to turn men to fornication. And men hung by their loins in that place of fire, unquote. The sexuality of hair has a long history. There were specific laws in Europe on hair pulling, modulating in severity depending on whether the hair pulled was male or female, and whether the culprit was free or slave. Women's hair remains sexualized in Italian love poetry <coughs> of the 13th and 14th centuries, and Dante himself, in one of his most erotic lyrics, imagines grabbing his resistant lover by her beautiful golden braids. But in the other world of the Commedia, Dante imagines no women hung or pulled by their hair. Rather, the sexualized hair pulling of his passionate canzone feeds into the episode in Inferno 32, where the pilgrim pulls the hair of the Florentine ardent traitor from the Battle of Montaperti, Botta, Bocca degli Abati, a man. This kind of transferal of a stereotype stiff with sexual or ethnic degradation to an application that is no longer stereotypical but supremely local and supple with historical specificity is typical of Dante's imaginary processes. In other words, I am linking the saturation in historical specificity that is one of the Commedia's technical <coughs> hallmarks to a non-stereotyping forma mentis. As we know, even from the modest use of fire and devils in Dante's Hell, he is rarely compelled by popular stereotypes. At the end of the vision tradition is Thurkel's vision, dated 1206, of English provenance. His adulterers must fornicate publicly in an infernal amphitheater, and then they tear each other to pieces. I'm going to a little quote from Thurkel's vision. Quote, an adulterer was now brought into the sight of the furious demons together with an adulteress, united together in foul contact. In the presence of all, they repeated their disgraceful lovemaking and immodest gestures to their own confusion and amid the cursing of the demons. Then, as if smitten with frenzy, they began to tear one another. Unquote. It goes without saying that Dante's adulterers, Paolo and Francesca, to whom I was just speaking to, to a class, it goes without saying that Paolo and Francesca do not fornicate in public for demons. Or rather, although it has always gone without saying it, maybe we should say it, in other words, create some cultural context, <laughs> as a thought experiment. To say it focus, uh, forces us to envision the Divine Comedy as a completely different text, but actually a much more typical text of its period, a, a text that would be more like Thurkel's vision. Instead, Dante's treatment of lust emphasizes the psychology of desire. His adulterers are tossed by a hellish storm, as in life they were tossed by their passions. The distance between Dante and the various moralistic traditions not only visions, but also didactic poetry and sermons, is immense. He is interested, in the case, in the context of, of sexuality, not in what the moralists call fornication, but in the self's negotiation of desire. The visionaries are quite insistent that the tortures inflicted on fornicators are genital tortures. So this is now going to be a little technical. Visual depictions of hell are similarly focused. The last judgment of Dante's contemporary Giotto, 1267 to 1337, in the Scrovegni Chapel in Padova, offers graphic images of what two art historians, <coughs> Anna Derbis and Mark Santona, call, quote, this is their language, torments directed at genitalia, further describing Giotto's figures thus. For instance, just below Satan's left arm and on the bristly back of a serpentine monster, 
is a soul doomed to spend eternity with a reptilian green demon gnawing on his penis. I'm reading from art historians, and you can see it there. Still, the art historians, above and to the right of Satan, a black demon grips another man's penis in pincers. Hanging to the right are four more damned souls, one male, two female. I think you have to switch slides now. Who are suspended by their genitals, another by his tongue, and the fourth by her long hair, a common sign of luxuria. The fact that her hair is braided may also signify her concupiscence, unquote. From Tadeo di Bartolo, this is a uh, late 14th century, 1396, so we're now well past Dante's death. From Tadeo di Bartolo's late 14th century hell in San Gimignano comes this detail of a female sinner sexually punished for the sin of fornication. So if I could have Tadeo di Bartolo. So he would have a female sinner sexually punished for the sin of fornication by a bestial female demon. Again, this is the sin for which Dante's punishment is an infernal windstorm that corresponds to the inner turmoil of uncontrolled passion, as depicted in this late 14th century illustration of Inferno V. Okay, so there are some late 14th century illustrations of Inferno V. I don't need to go back to Tadeo di Bartolo for you to see the difference, do I? Right, okay. I know a little Tadeo di Bartolo goes a long way. <laughs> okay. But it makes the point very well. <laughs> In his treatment of women as well, stereotypes of degraded sexuality have little purchase over Dante's imagination. In Dante's circle of lust, the name of historical specificity is Francesca da Rimini, an adulteress. She is the Commedia's second most famous female after Beatrice, and like Beatrice, we would never have heard of her were it not for Dante. If we step outside the text to historicize Francesca in our reading of Inferno V, a picture emerges in which Dante writes a gendered story that places unusual value on the personhood of the dynastic wife. Dynastically unimportant, Francesca was forgotten by contemporary local chroniclers. The first and most authoritative chronicler of Rimini was Marco Battagli, who's on the origins of the Malatesta of 1352, alludes to the uh, event in which Francesca died without naming her, indeed without acknowledging her existence, except as an implicit cause of her lover Paolo's death, which occurred causa luxuriae, an account of lust. No female agent present in the story at all. The quote in English is, Paolo was killed by his brother Gianciotto, Causa Luxuria, on account of lust. In that dynastic account, one son of Malatesta da Verrucchio, the founding patriarch of the Malatesta dynasty, killed the other. This fact is of interest because it affects the history of the dynasty. Francesca matters not a bit in herself. And in fact, the only historical document that records her name is the will of her father-in-law, in which he refers to, quote, the dowry of the late Lady Francesca, unquote. Otherwise, complete historical silence. The silence of the contemporary historical records is reflected in the silence of our commentaries to Inferno V, which do not tell us about the chronicler's silence thus making it impossible for the reader to know that, in effect, Dante preserved Francesca. He recorded her name, and he gave her a voice. And perhaps most significant, through the famous story she tells of how she and Paolo fell in love while reading, he made her a reader rather than a fornicator. Francesca's is the only contemporary name registered in Ferdinand V. Paolo's name is absent, as is Gianciotto's. She is the protagonist, she is the agent, she is the one who speaks. Through the intervention of Inferno V, Francesca became a cultural touchstone and reference point, achieving a dignity and a prominence, a celebrity, and all you have to do is look into all the paintings, operas, plays, poems that have been written about her, that in real life she did not possess, without 
the intervention of Inver Five, there would have been none of those paintings and operas because no one would ever have heard of her. The historical records do not refer to her. If we stand outside of the fiction of who is damned and who is saved, in other words, if we stand outside of a reading that would basically say, Dante treats her badly because he puts her in hell, and if we create a larger historical uh, context, then we can see that Dante acted as the historian of record for Francesca da Rimini, and for many other women as well. He seems particularly drawn to cases of marital and family abuse. We think of Pia in Purgatorio III and Picarda in Paradiso III. While there are famous women in the Commedia, such as Santa Chiara of Assisi and the Empress, Empress Costanza, the text seems to engage more fully with women otherwise lost to history. Dante's portraits of them, while brief, allow for subjectivity and assign moral agency. The fact that Francesca is damned, that Dante damns Francesca in his fiction, has garnered all the critical attention. A sub subcategory of this critical approach being to castigate him for casting her as a misreader, an early Madame Bovary. While the fact that he saves her to history and to cultural memory, and that he lets her read it all, has gone mostly unremarked. In the same way, to anticipate a later part of my argument today, the fact that Dante damns Virgil, Aristotle, and the other virtuous pagans is given more historiographic weight than the fact that he literally rewrites the theology of limbo in order to mitigate their damnation and is still wrestling with their exclusion from grace in Paradiso. When I say given more historiographic weight, it's because of how many historic, early modern historians I have read who use Dante's uh, limbo effectively as a line of demarcation. That's medieval because Aristotle is in hell, which is a completely unhistorical understanding of limbo, which is interesting to me that historians do it. An imagination that is not compelled by popular stereotypes is also at work in the Commedia's handling of sodomy. Giotto and Taddeo di Bartolo, in their last judgments, depict sodomites, and now this is a, another um, um, slide, and this is now a quote from the same art historians, and a, oh, that's still a good five. Forward. Oh, oh, this is where I had, I just had more to show you, Paolo and Francesca, okay. This is still, this is Blake, Paolo, and Francesca. Blake, Paolo, Adore, Paolo, and Francesca. Reading and being discovered. Blacksman, reading and being discovered. Ah, here we have it. Tadeo Di Bartolo. <laughs> Thank you. So, the art historians say, describe this as Tadeo's uh, sodomite skewered from mouth to rear by a pole. He's been labeled with the category that has replaced his personhood. Sodomito, you see the sign. Dante's damned sodomites are Florentines who are individually named. Brunetto Latini, the next slide, please. These are 14th century again. Brunetto Latini, Guido Guerra, and Tegliaio Aldobrandi. They run on a scorching plain under flakes of fire. Jacopo, Guido, and Tegaio are further described as like three wrestlers. I think there are some more pictures of them. Mm -hmm. This is Brunetto Dore. This is um, the three wrestler, the, the, the three boards in Sodomites of the 16, in the simile that describes them. Here they are in Blake. And then probably here is Blacksman. So these are Dante Sodomites in Ferno 16. All right, we could stop. Thank you. So um, I do not, I need a point of clarification here. I do not raise the issue of the divergence in punishment because I want to measure gradations in severity or because I want to congratulate Dante on less severe punishments. I am not raising an issue of quantitative measurement but of qualitatively incommensurate <coughs> sources of inspiration. Dante is not dealing with <coughs> externally imposed punishments, but with literalized metaphors that represent the soul's inner state. 
These literalized metaphors are ways of signifying the path whereby the soul falls into the order that is sin, defined by St. Thomas as an act lacking the order that it should have. The sexual act is not what interests Dante in his treatment of lust. What interests him and what he tries to depict is the soul's disordered belief that it is experiencing compulsion, its belief that it does not possess the free will with which to resist desire. Hence, there is no suspending of women from their etymologically luxuriant hair while a devil, a devil penetrates them sexually, as in Tadeo di Bartolo's depiction of the lustful. There is instead, as you saw, the wind that literalizes the compulsion that the lovers believed that they experienced. Importantly, Dante does not imagine sexualized tortures at all. He does not pander to the most violently pornographic impulses of the viewer. If the absence of sexualized torture from the Commedia is counterintuitive, and I can tell you that I discovered in my research for this, at least one art historian who actually suggests that Giotto's, textualized, Giotto's sexualized tortures, the ones that I showed you in the first slide, come from the Divine Comedy. That's the degree to which the Divine Comedy has entered the cultural imaginary as what it is not. So, if the absence of sexualized torture from the Commedia is counterintuitive, that is because we are in the grip of a reception history which imposes its own logic. We must also contend with the re relentless appropriation of Dante's authority by the Catholic Church, sorry to say it, and the Italian state, which have successfully reconfigured this unorthodox thinker as an enforcer of orthodoxy. The example I'm gonna give you is from the Italian state, not the Catholic Church. No, it's not an image, it's a, it's a quote. A recent example of such appropriation is the rebuke issued by former Prime Minister Andreotti to his political opponents in the Italian debate on same-sex union. And, you know, I'm just quoting this as a Dante scholar who likes Dante to be treated with accuracy. So, <laughs> Andreotti said in the Corriere della Sera of 14 February 2007, Non sarebbe male se tutti, compreso Prodi, si andassero a rileggere Dante. I sodomiti nella Divina Commedia finiscono all'inferno. It would be a good thing if everyone, Prodi included, Prodi was his main political opponent in this debate on same-sex union. It would be a good thing if everyone, Prodi included, were to reread Dante. The sodomites in the Divine Comedy end up in hell. Ah, <laughs> had Andreotti read Beyond Inferno, which by the way, I know he has, which makes it all the more interesting, <coughs> to Purgatorio 26, he would have realized that Dante's treatment of homosexuality is not so simple. Yes, Dante places homosexuals in hell, classifying them as violent against nature, but his purgatorial terrace of lust features both heterosexuals and homosexuals, two files of souls moving in opposite directions around the fiery terrace who meet and hastily exchange brief kisses. You can see the two files of souls in this 14th, this 14th century illustration of the Terrace of Lust, which is in Purgatory Canto 26. The figures in one group are identified as those whose sin was such that, was such, was that for which Caesar heard himself called Regina, Queen, when he par paraded in triumph through Rome. Part of their penance is calling out Sodoma as they move through the purging flames of the Terrace of Lust. Remembering the context provided by the image labeled Sodomito in Tadeo di Bartolo's Hell, we note, one, the sec that the sexually charged violence of the visions and the pictorial tradition finds no echo in Dante's infernal treatment of homosexuality, and two, Dante, and this is most important, he's able to imagine sodomites in purgatory. In other words, to imagine that they can be saved. That's really very important. And was really only recuperated for the critical tradition by John Boswell's book. In that case, a historian coming to the rescue. Dante could have precluded 
any discussion of saved sodomites by simply ignoring homosexuality outside of the affair room. Okay? So the same way that nobody would have ever gotten on his case if he had never saved any pagans, no one was going to get on his case if he had not put sodomites in purgatory. Rather, it's the converse that's the case. And we have pretty much, in this case, had a reception history that has not really dealt with what it is that he's done. So he could easily have avoided mentioning sodomy and purgatory, and then he would not have had to reclassify it. Um, sodomy in the Commedia would have remained classified in only one way as a sin of violence against nature, which is how he treats it in hell, without needing to undergo the reclassification required by the transition to purgatory, a realm organized by Dante according to the seven capital vices. By, in other words, by putting sodomy in purgatory, where he doesn't have all those different categories that he has in hell, for instance, violence, and there he could make it a, a sin of violence against nature. Once he gets to purgatory, he has nowhere to put it but as a sin of lust. The second he's put it as a sin of lust, he's completely changed the nature of the discussion from a, from a conceptual and philosophical point of view. As a result of the, de of the decision to reference sodomy in the purgatorio, homosexuality is reclassified as a form of lust and thus homosexuals undergo purgation along with heterosexuals on the terrace of lust. Dante's reclassification has far-reaching implications since it tells us that lust, excess desire, is the impulse that underlies any form of sexuality, normative or non-normative. <clears throat> now I'm going to switch to ethnic considerations. In ethnic terms as well, I believe we can see Dante pushing at the normative boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. At one time, in, a, in the opening chapter of Dante and the Origins of Italian Literary Culture, the, the book of my essays that came out in, in 2006, at that time I wrote, quote, Dante was not immune from the blind spots of his time, nor his poem without historical state. And I still believe that. At that time I gave as an example Sylvia Tomasch's essay on what Sylvia Tomas calls the erasure of Jews, who, quote, never appear as Jews anywhere in the divine comedy. <coughs> while there, and now I'm saying I've revised my point of view, because while there are remarks in the Commedia that I would classify as anti-Jewish, and I am thinking in particular of the acceptance of the deicide charge in Paradiso 7, I am no longer convinced by Tomas's argument that the absence of Jews from the Commedia is itself a negative. Once I had viewed the virulent visual evidence on Jews coming, it is true, from Germany, England, and France, we have less from Italy, laid out in Deborah Strickland's book, Saracens, Demons, and Jews, Making Monsters in Medieval Art. So maybe there's a picture of that book title next in the um, maybe there's a cover of that book. Oh, that's Flaxman. Okay. So this is the this this book is a very useful book. Um, and once I had viewed the visual evidence on Jews in this book, I decided that in this case exclusion is a good thing. In a context in which visual representations of hell were full of contemporary Jews depicted with the visual stereotypes that served in the Middle Ages as markers for Jews, hooked noses, frigid caps, and money bags. In that context, the absence of any contemporary Jews in Dante's Hill may again indicate the non-stereotyping nature of his imaginative processes. So if you could just uh, move to the next slide, you will see there um, uh, a slide from Deborah Strickland's book where you can see the hooked noses, you see the frigid caps, and I, maybe there's not a money bag here, but I'm going to show you a money bag if we go on. Okay, there you can see, well there you see frigid caps, and these are Jews going into, that's the mouth of hell, <coughs> called hell mouth. 
in the iconography. And the, the Jews, the contemporary Jews, are descending into hell now. And then in the, there's another one coming. But that's just a, a monster given a Jewish head. And here, this is an extraordinary one. There you can see Hellmouth and the cauldron of hell in Hellmouth. And the figure whose face is somewhat abraded has a money bag around his neck. <coughs> so Rachel Jacoff writes that by the time Dante was writing the Inferno, the negative associations of Jews with usury were current. But she notes Dante's usurers are all Christian. We can build on Jacob's observation. <coughs> and we can note that Dante, and so this is important, Dante transfers the stereotypic image used for Jews in the visual iconography I've shown you, that is, money bags worn around the neck. He transfers it from the stereotypic wearers, the Jews who were synonymous with usury in much of Europe, to contemporary Florentines and one Padovano the people that you know are in Inferno 17, where the usurers are. And by the way, that Padovano is Reginaldo Scroveni, who was the father of the man who commissioned Giotto Scroveni Chapel that we saw the Last Judgment from. Recent scholarship on the frescoes in the Scroveni Chapel remarks on Giotto's de deployment of what the scholars call, quote, some <coughs> visual disparaging of Jews and other non-believers. So though this visual, uh, battery of images I've shown you, stereotyping Jews is from Northern Europe, which was much worse. I did find a recent <coughs> book on Giotto, which argues that there is some visual stereotyping of Jews in the Scroveni chapel. All the more suggestive then, that in his treatment of the sin that was most associated with Jews in medieval Europe, namely usury, Dante uses the marker worn by Jews, the money bags, and he transfers it to usurers from well-known non-Jewish families. He specifies that the bag is worn around the neck, and he makes sure that each family is represented in its indelible historical specificity by placing the insignia of the family on the money bag and describing the insignia in verses whose precision could allow them to, to, to work as illustrators' instructions. And now you can show uh, the the slide with the insignia. There you can see how the early commentators could immediately uh, draw, uh, paint the insignia. We have the Florentine Obriaki family, white goose on a red field. Um, the Florentine Gianfigliazzi family, azure lion on a gold field. field and the Padovano Scroveni family, azure sow on a white field. And I think maybe I have another one of those. It's on top, there's more usurers. And then I think there might be Blake. Yeah, that's Blake's features. Coming to the other ethnic group in Strickland's title, Saracens, Demons, and Jews, Dante places Mohammed and his son Ali in hell among the schismatics, those who divided and sundered that which should be kept united, in their case, the Christian church. The souls in this bolgia, which includes disseminators of civil as well as religious discord, are mutilated in ways that indicate their mutilation of the body politic. Again, a literalized metaphor. Dante places, continuing to think about Muslims in the Divine Comedy, Dante places Saladin, the renowned 12th century Muslim general and reconqueror of Jerusalem, in the special part of limbo that he creates for virtuous pagans, along with the great Muslim philosophers, Avicenna and Averroes. In his philosophical treatise, Convivio, also, Dante treats Muslim philosophers with the respect that he shows the classical philosophers who are his cultural heroes. <clears throat> Petrarch, by way of comparison in the next generation, shows no appreciation for Muslim learning or culture, enacting a wholesale cultural denigration of Islam, deploying east-west stereotypes, and art articulating a set of orientalizing tropes that later humanists will adopt. In this context, we can see Dante, if we compare him to Petrarch in this way, offering, as he often does, a less unilateral posture. I would never claim that he was altogether tolerant, just as I would never claim that his views or women are altogether progressive. There's also misogyny. But whereas 
in Petra, you can really find a pretty, I don't think there's any exception to the anti-Islamic uh, uh, rhetoric that he uses. In Dante, you find a mixture. And I think this is true with respect to women, and as it's true with respect to uh, other ethnic categories. Now I'm going to come to limbo. So to be clear, Averroes, like Avicenna, they are in limbo. And limbo is the first circle of hell. But limbo is susceptible to historical variation, like any human invention. And it has to be put into historical context. As I mentioned earlier, theologians placed only unbaptized infants in limbo. The Hebrew patriarchs and matriarchs who predeceased Christ were once there, but you will recall that they were rescued and raised to heaven by Christ's heroine of hell. The very idea of placing adults of any sort in limbo is non-orthodox, let alone adult non-believers. Dante makes his own theology when he places adult virtuous pagans in limbo, in a move with far-reaching implications regarding the value of great thought and culture, prized by Dante even if the provenance is not Christian. He honors the virtuous pagans of antiquity, as you know, along with selected Muslim moderns, and then he does more. He does not limit himself to speculating as to whether virtuous pagans can be saved, as Aquinas does. He saves specific pagans, Cato, Trajan, Statius, and most spectacularly, Riffius the Trojan, a figure mentioned in Virgil's Aeneid. I want to think about this as a form of what I call medieval <coughs> multiculturalism. I use multiculturalism to refer to the eclectic fusion of intellectual and ideological traditions deriving from different times and places. And I do so deliberately in order to suggest that Dante's vertical syncretism, his interaction with the other of the past, is just as significant in its own time and place as the horizontal variety of syncretism <coughs> that we practice today. If we think about this notion of the other in the Divine Comedy. We've talked about sexual others. We've talked about some ethnic others. But there's also the question of the other in the past that's extremely alive for a Christian thinker of the 14th century. Cultural otherness is included in the Commedia, as you all know, very vigorously in the presence of Virgilio, the guide who accompanies the pilgrim from Inferno 1 to Purgatorio 30, and around whom Dante constructs a narrative that embodies the tension between Aliud and Ipsum, from that beautiful quote of Augustine's with which I began. I'm going to conclude with some other examples, some other examples of the other. Um, we understand about Virgilio, and we understand about the virtuous pagans. But in the heaven of justice, where Dante puts the, the legitimacy of exclusion from grace <coughs> on the table for discussion, the question of how it can be just that souls are damned through no fault of their own is articulated in very interesting language. On the one hand, he articulates the question. The question is, how can it be just that someone completely virtuous can be excluded from grace? That's the question. He poses it in language that, for the reader of the Divine Comedy, clearly evokes the figure of Virgilio, the virtuous person excluded from grace with whom we have spent two-thirds of the poem. But he goes further. He replaces the temporal framing of the issue, the issue that looks at virtuous pagans as belonging to the past, with a geographical frame. And he conjures not a non-believer of antiquity, but a contemporary born on the banks of the Indus River. This is Paradiso 19, verses 70 to 77, which I will read maybe just in translation. For you would say, a man is born upon the bank of the Indus, with no one there to speak or read or write of Christ. And this man, as far as human reason sees, in all he seeks and all he does is good. 
He is sinless in his deeds and in his words. This man dies unbaptized, without faith. Wherein lies the justice that condemns him? Wherein lies his fault if he does not believe? The language of this extraordinary challenge to orthodoxy, with its searing questions, ove questa giustizia che lo condanna, ove la colpa sua se non crede, resonates with the poem's many descriptions of Virgilio, as I already said. But by posing this greatest of his intellectual challenges in its geographical form, as a query about the fairness of condemning the perfectly virtuous man born on the banks of the Indus, Dante indicates that he views contemporary ethnic and cultural communities different from his own, for instance, the Indians, a term used generically for peoples of the East, as in some way analogous to the Greeks and Romans of antiquity. The choice of Riffius the Trojan as a surprise saved pagan revealed in the same heaven of justice that poses the dilemma of the virtuous man born on the banks of the Indus supports the analogy between temporal and geographic otherness, as though Riffius were also standing in for that virtuous Indian, and in fact, Troy is further east than Rome or Athens. The most far away and exotic peoples referred to in the Commedia, and always coordinated as though to acknowledge their similar otherness, are the Indians and the Ethiopians as black Africans were called. Later on in the very canto that challenges <coughs> divine justice with respect to the man born on the banks of the Indus, we learn that there will be Ethiopians nearer to God at the judgment day than many Christians. And I quote again from Paradiso 19. But see, there are many who now cry, Christ, Christ, who at the final judgment shall be less close to him than one who knows not Christ. The Ethiopian will damn such Christians when the two companies are separated, the one forever rich, the other poor. We can contrast Dante's provocative remark on the possibility of saved Ethiopians, all the more provocative for coming in a, he in a heaven which has already gone out of its way to save Riffius the Trojan. We can contrast that to Deborah, Deborah Strickland's contention, and now if you could give me the next slide, that, quote, Oh, that's limbo, sorry. So <coughs> that's Riffius the Trojan, uh, still the heaven of justice. And now this is Deborah Strickland. These are her Ethiopians from that book that I showed you, and she contends that, quote, Ethiopians and demons are dramatically allied in pictorial <coughs> works of art of this period. If we compare this image, using it as cultural context, to the end of Paradiso 19, where Dante says that there are many Ethiopians who will be closer than Christians to God at the Judgment Day, I think we have another opportunity to create a richer context for, for reading the Divine Comedy. So, just in conclusion, the various forms of sympathy, I'm going to skip some other examples that I have, though they're very interesting, some other negative remarks about Ethiopians, from Boccaccio's Corbaccio, from uh, uh, the Dita Mondo, because I think, um, I think you get the point. I'm just going to conclude by saying that the various forms of sympathy toward the other that we have considered could be arranged on a spectrum, from the profound psychological identification that causes Dante to faint after meeting Francesca, to his assertive dignified of the Ethiopian and his ability actively to imagine the salvation of sodomites and pagans to his demonstrable lack of difference, excuse me, lack of interest in stereotyping ethnic groups different from his own, such as the Jews. Behind these various forms of sympathy toward the other is an imagination captivated by difference, not only by la gloria di colui che tutto muove, the glory of him who moves everything in the first verse of the Paradiso, but also by the process whereby that glory is differentiated in una parte più e meno altrove, in one part more and in another less. When Dante reaches the end of his vision and is granted the sight of the universe bound together in one volume, what entrances him is not plain oneness, 
but all that multiplicity somehow contained and unified. His heart is set on knowing and seeing that multiplicity, an otherness that is still stubbornly present in the poem's penultimate word. God is the love, we remember, in the last verse of the Divine Comedy, that moves the sun and the other stars. Much has been written about the transcendent stelle with which the Commedia ends. Let us give due weight as well to the adjective that modifies those stars, the poem's penultimate word, other. Dante may believe in a transcendent one, he does, but his one is indelibly characterized by the multiplicity, difference, and sheer otherness embodied in the Atre Stelle, an otherness by which he is still unrepentantly captivated in his poem's last breath. Thank you.